the new covenant and I've called it song three because we're in Zechariah's song and yeah, there's three sections to the song and that's where we're at and uh, if you're not aware possibly um, there's a study that I work in about 12 hours a day and it's what we would refer to as the office and um, if you've not been in there there's on the top shelf is all Bibles uh, it's I try not to mix it with other books or commentaries or uh, things like that because it's the top shelf it deserves to be in a class all by itself amen so it's it's there on the top shelf and it's the Word of God and um, I like to look at all the different translations and many of us here within the assembly have been talking about translations a lot because many of us have the new legacy standard Bible that just came out this year and um, it is one of the most accurate translations and it's interesting to, to be living in this time of history uh, to where this translation is uh, out and we have access to this and Aubrey read it this morning and the Psalms and the, the sacred name of God is translated as Yahweh. We love that. And so translations are a big topic with us. Uh, and, and we like to look at the original languages here and things like that. But, but I would say that a very unique translation that we might not talk about a lot is the KJV, the, the 1611 King James Version. And, and I know that some of us may not talk about that because there's some that have went so far to maybe say that that's the only one that you're able to read and and we respect their opinion and we love them um, but 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 it is a unique translation and it's very accurate and it's good and it's not a bad thing and and it's it captures the beauty of the Hebrew pictorial language especially you know that already but uh, the, the King James though uses a very unique word and would you believe it that Dwayne actually used the word this morning and we've not shared notes and he used the word and I looked at him with a weird look so he would recall this memory he used the word peculiar when I was getting my water in Sunday school I looked at him with big eyes like hey remember that because I like that word King, New King James uses the word special uh, it's not really in the Greek, but it's okay. It, it's capturing the beauty of the language and and the the original Greek word for peculiar It's the adjective word is is a people or loion in Greek But let me give you an example Titus 214 in the KJV King James Titus 214 Uses this word that I like it. It says Christ he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all our inequity and purify unto himself here you go a peculiar people zealous of good works I like that word peculiar weird strange odd why well because we're under a very peculiar covenant aren't we it's called the new covenant a very unusual covenant and then we could even use the word eccentric we can learn much from the Jewish people very so much can we learn from them and uh, the Noahic and the priestly and the Mosaic Covenant though are, are non salvific and there's not promises associated to salvation in those and we've done looked at Zechariah's covenant talk and song he's singing at the birth of his son John the Baptist and he's done sung about the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant we've spent the last two weeks in that those are beautiful and the Davidic covenants require salvation though for their blessings to be realized and nothing in them though provides it and uh, but there's a problem though and it's also hard to enjoy those covenants as well Abrahamic and, and Davidic because there's a barrier um, and that barrier is something that we uh, don't talk about often uh, we have kind of watered down the language and call it wrongdoings but the barrier uh, keeps us from enjoying Abrahamic and Davidic covenant is sin really is and for that issue it's going to require a superior covenant isn't it one that's going to provide total forgiveness of sin that's what the Hebrew writer talks about so there's 
you know, that's, that's the true problem though is it's not so much political or, or psychological or social. It's not really about how we think, act, or, or even speak. I mean, those things just merely reflect the issue, don't they? The true problem. And the true problem is that all are sinners. But really, an evil, defiled heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 said, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. It's actually worse than stage four cancer. The Apostle Paul gives the universal description, though, of sin in Romans 3. Truly, he does. He said there's no one righteous. He's done acknowledge those who are under the light of nature, which would be the Gentiles in Romans 1, those who are under the light of special revelation, the Jews in Romans 2. He says, eh, doesn't matter. Romans 3, 9, all are under sin. And then none righteous, not even one. None who understands, none who seeks for God, all have turned aside, and together, he said, they've become soured milk. You say, what? That's what the word worthless means. None who does good, none, not even one. He said their throat is an open grave, and their tongues, notice the body part that he's using here. Jot that down in your note. We'll get to that later. Their tongues, and then he said the poison of apps is under these things, and then he said their mouth is full of cursing, and then he says their feet are swift to shed blood. And he said, destruction and misery are in their paths. It destroys families. It destroys the community, the public school system, and, and, and even Walt Disney. Verse 17, and the path of peace, he said, they have not known. And he said, there's no fear of God before their eyes. So because no fear, because of no peace, no awareness of the judgment of God. You know this. So obviously, it's not a popular topic today in our coddled culture. But... Sin is this operative reality that, that really dominates the inside of the individual. It actually compels behavior, much like hunger pains and even thirst or sexual desires. Fear and anger, that's why when there is that indwelling sin, it will actually manipulate. You say manipulate what? And that is the, the behavior, and it does it from the inside of the individual. And that's why you can tighten up the bootstraps all, the, all that you want. There's no willpower and there's really no even self-determination that can change the heart. Overpower that law of sin. It's impossible. You say, well, kid, what's the point of the law? The mirror reflects our bankruptcy points us to the need for mercy. It points us to the need for grace. It's the tutor, Paul said in Galatians 3.24, that leads us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. He said, this is a long introduction this morning, but that's okay. I'm building, I'm building a house, if you will. There's a trajectory we're going to hit at the very end, and I've got to lay an extensive foundation. And this is illustrated in the Old Testament. If you want to look back at Exodus chapter 24, it's okay. Exodus chapter 24, this is beautifully illustrated. This is exactly what happened. Israel understood this truth. Everybody had wonderful intentions to try to do this, and they vowed obedience, and they even sealed this obedience with a pledge. Exodus 24, 4, Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh. Then he arose early in the morning. He built the altar at the foot of the mountain, the 12 pillars, 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men. He sent the young lads of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings, sacrificed young bulls, and peace offerings to Yahweh. He took half of the blood, 
other half the blood sprinkled on the altar and then he took the book of the covenant probably uh, these legal laws that you read in Exodus 21 22 and 23 and he read it to the hearing of the people and they said quote all that Yahweh has spoken we will do and we will be obedient so you got all these 600,000 people and then verse 8 of Exodus 24 he takes the blood he sprinkles it on the people and said behold the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has cut in ASB uses the word made Legacy gets it right. Cut with you in accordance with all these words. They vowed, even sealed it with blood. But in all that, even as great as that is, it couldn't overcome the sinful nature. Yeah, couldn't do it. And then you fast forward about 20 years and they're wandering around and Moses gives his little farewell speech in Deuteronomy 28 he describes the blessings that would come from obedience or the warned of the consequences. You know this already. And he gives the two illustrations, philosophy, the two laws of logic. He points to two mountains. And they're beside each other. Mount Gerizim, Mount Ebal. Ebal represented Samaria, the flesh, disobedience. But Deuteronomy 28, Mount Gerizim facing towards Jerusalem points to the spirit. And obedience and he says you can just do which one you want and Joshua comes on the scene same thing challenges the people Joshua 24 15 Joshua says if disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord then choose for yourselves today whom you're going to serve are the gods of your fathers which served beyond the river the gods of the Amorites as for me in my house what did he say we're going to serve the Lord. Basically what he was saying is serve Satan or serve God. And then you have the people's response in Joshua 24, 16. Here it is. You ready? The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake Yahweh and serve other gods. Once again, good intentions. And when Joshua further cautioned them in, in verse 20, look what he said. He forsake the Lord, serve foreign gods, then he's going to turn and, and do you harm and consume you after he's done good to you. And once again, they protested. No, but we will serve Yahweh. We will serve Yahweh our God and we will obey his voice. Joshua 24, 21, 24. Well, once again, great intentions. And then welcome to, like Brother Mickey's commentary, welcome to the book of Judges. Yeah, complete disaster. Judges 2, you got this new generation who didn't know God. Serving Baal, bowing down, totally ignoring God. The Lord was against them and, and they're distressed. No wonder they're a hot mess. No joy, mad at the world. So what was needed was God to intervene. And is it going to be possible to be a part of an actual covenant that's going to actually provide forgiveness? And not only just that, but the power to obey? Can we get some help here? Forgiven sin, a heart surgery, and then a shot of obedience. It takes a true student of the Old Testament to understand the beauty of it. And the Old Testament is under such attack in the church today, in America especially. Apologetics for the defense and the existence of God, yes, that's needed. But I want to be an apologist for the Old Testament. One who understands the covenants and the fulfillment through Mashiach, Messiah, Christ. Such a man is not me, though. Such a man is Zacharias, the old priest. And um, he broke out in this song and did a little jig danced, sung a hymn over Davidic and Abrahamic, and now the climax, the, the, the peculiar, the eccentric, the most beautiful, 
new covenant, his third song. And therefore, I would direct your attention to the text. Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 76 through 80. This is the inerrant, infallible, indestructible word of God. And it reads, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go on before the Lord to make ready his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death to direct our feet into the way of peace. Luke comes in and says, and the child continued to grow and to become strong in spirit. And he lived in the desolate regions until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Lord God Almighty, Father, thank you. Thank you. And we are so excited to, to get into this word that our hearts would be inflamed and that our minds would be ignited and that our wills would be invited to engage and to seek and to save and to remember the mission of Christ. Lord God, please fill us with a flame, a holy zeal, a deeper allegiance to Christ. Please, Father, forgive us and restore in us anew that your word will truly bring revival in our hearts. In Christ's name, in his sinless name we pray. Amen. All right. Bombarded by a culture of individualism, we truly are. We might expect that his song to really be all about his little boy, little Johnny. Little John. Little John the Baptist. Well... Are you surprised that he really didn't do that? But instead, he begins his song by talking about the Messiah and Davidic and, and Abrahamic covenants whom God was sending, Christ. So before he sings about the new covenant, address what's going on in the text, starting in verses 67 through 79, which is where we've been for three weeks now. So, so notice that he addresses those things first before he addresses little Johnny. His son, the newborn, John the Baptist. A couple quick things that he says here in verse 76. John would be called, he says in verse 76, the prophet of the Most High. That's interesting in its proper context because we've done had 400 years of silence here and the Jewish people really had a deep understanding of the silence of God. And they said, <clears throat> there's times where we need to be silent. What a rebuke to me. And James, the Jew, understood that. He said, be careful, teachers. God's going to judge us more, isn't he? And then in the same context of James 3, what's he talk about? That piece of skin that hides behind my teeth. The Jews understood silence as a disciplinary act of God. So therefore, now there's this prophet stepping on scene. Verse 76, he's going to end that 400 years of silence. One of the most scariest pages in the Bible, beloved, is that blank page between the Testaments, isn't it? And then you've got the end of verse 76. John's ministry would be the one to go on before the Lord and to prepare his ways. And, and Isaiah the prophet talked about this about 600 years prior to. And, and he said, and, and then Jesus, in, in the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brought this into the New Testament, Matthew 3, 3, when, when, when they said that John's going to be the voice, a voice, praise God for a voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, prepare his path straight, corresponding to Malachi 3.1. And then John, though he had this uncompromising message, 
The uncompromising message was that the people, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, should repent. A metanuo, changing of the mind, leading to a state and condition of the will. Repentance always starts in the mind. For the kingdom, John said, of heaven is at hand. And John also would even challenge the legitimacy of those who would claim to repent. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, when those Pharisees and Sadducees came, you remember John's message to them? You brood of vipers. He said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Why did he say that? Because there is wrath to come. And therefore, bear fruit, keeping with repentance. Do not suppose to yourselves that we have Abraham for our father. The Baptist, John said, I'll say to you from these stones, and stones are everywhere in Israel. It's all rocky. He said, these stones, God's able to raise up children to Abraham you remember all that? So, so hear me out, though, please, beloved. John was not the rock star pastor that we call today. The celebrity-driven preacher. No. No, he wasn't. He didn't eat like everybody else. He didn't dress like everybody else. And his message, beloved, was totally countercultural to the popular conception of what the Messiah was to be. Oh, he's going to come and set up that throne. Oh, he's going to conquer, be a conquering hero. Oh, he's going to defeat all the enemies. No. Oh, he's going to, just going to usher around in that Abrahamic and David covenant. John said, no. Think again. John's saying, before realizing the blessings of Abrahamic and Davidic covenant, John's message was very Straight to the point, like a shotgun buckshot, he said, first, one has to have an understanding of the three-letter word that America despises, and it's called S-I-N. A reality of sin which leads to repentance and seeking forgiveness which is provided not in Abrahamic, not in Davidic, but only in the New Covenant which was ratified on that murder device hanging behind my bald head. Amen. Which brings us to our first point. The promise. Look at your Bible. Verse 77 of your text. Would to God raise up in this nation more text-driven preachers. That's what we are about here. We're going to see, though, John's basic task. The old priest said was a knowledge of salvation to God's people. We've got to be careful here with the word knowledge. There's much debate in the theology world, and, and I like to read all that deep stuff, but then the responsibility is not to talk over so people's heads to where you walk out of here more confused than you walk in. We have to bring the cookies down. And that's not an insult to you. It's in, if anything. It's because I'm dumb. But we've got to learn to bring it all down to, to be able to understand this. And then there's much debate in the whole grammatical realm of what these words mean. You've got to figure out where you camp and land, which demands deep study. But I believe what being said here is the knowledge that he's using, Zechariah the priest, is not in view of a theocentric or a theological knowledge, but I believe that it's a personal knowledge that's only going to come by one who truly experiences forgiveness of sin and truly experiences God. <sighs> fired up this morning, man. Forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness. That's a precondition of being at peace with God, ain't it? Yeah. So in the context of the song, before we start jumping all over the Bible, this is where things go sour often. It's not an attack on anybody. It's just the truth. We always want to interpret each verse in light of each sentence, each sentence in light of each chapter, each chapter in light of each book, and then each book in light of the rest of the 65 books. So, keep it in context, right? We can do that. So in the context of the song, you look back at verse 68 through 71. Davidic. 
covenant. In the context of song, you look at verses 72 through 75, Abrahamic covenant. So now, the knowledge of salvation in the context of those two songs, yet neither one of those could forgive the three-letter word, S-I-N. So they could not change the heart, could they? That's the beauty of the promise. You say promise? Yeah. Now I feel that that is the most explicit Old Testament promise of the new covenant. I recall your attention to Jeremiah 31. Verses 31 through 34. Jeremiah says, Behold, days are coming. declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I've made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. Wrath and grace, covenant, a cutting of the covenant because he's holy, 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 we sang it, but yet there's the implementation of grace because they break covenant. All right, he says... I'll put my law within them and on their heart and I'm going to write it. God's a writer. And I will be their God and they will be my people. They shall not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, Know the Lord for they shall all know me. The chief goal of the Christian life is to know God. Declares the Lord for I will forgive their inequity and their sin and I will remember them no more. That's what makes it all so precious, the promise. Beautiful. Precious, precious, precious. But understanding that, because we have been guilty of reading that, we all have done it, and never really truly appreciate, we appreciate it, and I'm not saying that you don't or I don't, but the, the, the beauty and the essence and the relish, if you will, of that is to understand the context of Jeremiah. It's going to make it a little bit more beautiful. It's going to make it shine a little bit more. In the northern kingdom, Jeremiah's time, desperate situation. The northern kingdom had already fallen in 722 B.C. to the Assyrians. The southern kingdom, counting their days. And they were going to be wiped out very soon. Just on borrowed time. Jeremiah knew it. And all his warnings of judgment, every single thing that Jeremiah preached... He was mocked, he was scorned, he was made fun of, he was calling for repentance, but nobody wanted to hear it. They lost hope, even in Mosaic Covenant, really. So what God did, the context, he's he offering a new covenant. Moses spoke about it in Deuteronomy 30. Ezekiel spoke about it in Ezekiel 36. It's how God's going to redeem lost sinners from hell, judgment and hell. Ezekiel 36, it's beautiful because you have this sharp contrast to the external uh, mosaic law code, okay, and, and that God promised this new covenant and he's going to put his law within them. He's going to write it, okay, within their heart, uh, granting sinners a new heart. what that's saying, a heart surgery. Oh. What a promise. Heart surgery. God Almighty, please, Lord, bring the funds. Stop. No notes. I don't care. Prayer. Lord, please bring the funds to start a discipleship training center to address the drug pandemic in Perry County. Because the only thing that's going to affect individual rehabs and recovery like Carbondale, because it can't deal with the heart. Only thing it can do is bring moral reformation and maybe make a person clean and sober. It's a heart issue, isn't it? It's really just the beginning, though. You think, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, the promises, they'll keep going with God. They don't stop there. And the new covenant also provides deliverance from the power, the, 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 the penalty, and ultimately the presence of sin. The new covenant provides very uh, essential things, too, and, and that the other covenants even lacked. And the new heart, once again, the power to obey. Oh, the Holy Spirit and forgiveness. Okay, great. 
Who's the promise for? Peter said it in Acts 2. The promise is for you and for your children and for those whom are far off for whom the Lord God will call unto himself. Remember? He gave two conditions. Repent. Be baptized. Well, here he goes again. Well, and promises. And you will receive indwelling gift of the Spirit and forgiveness. Everyone who's ever or ever will be saved comes to salvation under the terms of the new covenant. This is what it is. It's beautiful. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through me, didn't he? It's okay. We can even read the old Puritans, J.C. Ryle, the minister of the gospel. He had an electric force. He said, about that verse of Jesus, he said, beware, quote, if we love life or supposing the mere earnestness, that mere earnestness alone is going to take a man to heaven. Though he know nothing of Christ, Ryle says, the idea is a deadly and ruinous error. Sincerity is never going to wipe away sin, Ryle said. It's not true that, it's not true that every man will be saved by his own religion, no matter what he believes provided his diligent and sincere disposition. We must not pretend to be wiser than God, Christ has said, and Christ will stand on it. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Close quote. So, we now move to not only the promise, but I want to transition to the source, and that wasn't a topical idea. We're just gleaning stuff from the text, and it's clear that he's addressing the source. Now, you're saying, boy, that steak there, or whatever it is, looks good. You're hungry. Looks good, don't it? The source of the new covenant. Look at verse 78. Notice the connective word. Because of the tender mercy of our God. That's enough to talk about. Once again, that's plenty enough to talk about. Because of the tender mercy of our God. There's your source right there of the new covenant. There it is. Look at the text. You got your notebooks, you got your new Bibles, you got your pens, and we're supplying everybody. You need pens and paper? Come see me. We got it. Get in there. Dig around in it. Look right there in your text and understand something as you look. That is the job. That is the obligation. That is the duty of the expositor to point people not to stories and skits and illustrations and drama and fog machines, but to the text. The text. Dude, lighten up. Look at it. It's the dead weight duty of the expositor to point people to the text. It's God's tender mercy. See it? Grab a hold of that in verse 78. Tender mercy. That's what moves God. God is moved to show compassion to the lost. You can't divorce those sin from mercy. Notice the connection. Notice the connection. The very vivid depiction here. When I outline my text, which is usually um, Monday... And then I step away like a marinated steak. You got to just marinate on the outline. Okay, I, to be honest with you, bathtub read the word tender all week long. And it wasn't until yesterday, day before yesterday, that I started sweating profusely in the office and I couldn't even think anymore because it was one of those moments through the word and through the spirit that I felt like busting through a brick wall. I was amazed by the presence of God through his word, by this word tender. It's changed my life. And it's taken one of those blue mountain goat moments that Pam always talked about where she said, stop dwelling down here. Get up here with God where the fresh air is like the blue mountain goat, man. Tender mercy. Very vivid, very intense word here, tender. The Greek word, literally. Are you ready for this? It literally means inner body parts. Okay. 
and give some examples, the Kittles Theological strong, uh, Smart People Dictionary, heart, liver, lungs, etc. What are you going to do with this, Yachts? Well, figurative language here describing the affections of the heart and, and the deep-seated affections of, of God's mercy and in combination with mercy, right? Yeah, that's what's going on here. So once again, I don't want to just start bouncing all over the Bible because my mind is like, okay, context, context, and we can go there real quick here. Mary's already talked about mercy, Luke 150. She rejoiced because the mercy is upon generation after generation, okay? Also, though, Zacharias earlier in the hymn was speaking about mercy in verse 72, right? So there's your context. But then, I'm like, this, this, this mercy goes all the way back to Genesis, don't it? Hang on a second. This mercy, I'll keep my hands back here. This mercy goes back to Genesis. I want you to flip back with me real quick, please, to the book of Genesis. Stay with me here. If you've got to stand up and stretch your legs, it's okay. I'm aware. I've got an eye up there. We're, we're okay. Genesis 2. Look at this mercy. Rachel, here, here's what I've been talking about with Tesla. Tesla, the rib. Tesla, where are you going with this? This is, this is beautiful. The Tesla of God. Look at Genesis chapter 2. All you legacy students, okay? Up until Genesis chapter 1, all you have is then God said. For an example, Genesis 1, 26, then God said. That's Elohim, creator. Okay, but Yahweh is introduced in verse 4 of Genesis 2. In that day that Yahweh God, Yahweh means he's the personal, self-sufficient God of Israel. Okay, he is the all-knowing, personal God. So now you have Yahweh, the personal God, mixed with God in chapter 2, verse 4, which is he's personal, but he's also Elohim. Moses is saying that he's personal, but he's still creating, right? You, you saying that God wasn't personal in, in Genesis 1.26 when he said, let us make man in our own image? No, he was personal. But what the writer, and then what, this is what uh, MacArthur captures in the legacy that others miss, okay? And what he's saying here is look at verse 22 of chapter 2. God's going to get a little bit more personal and even more intense when he makes the woman. Yahweh, God. Genesis 2.4 is when it begins. Then Yahweh God, Genesis 2, 7. Verse 15, Genesis 2. Then Yahweh God. Verse 18, Genesis 2. Then Yahweh God, personal but still creator. And then you got verse 22. And Yahweh God fashioned the rib. Where are you going with all this? Hebrew word for rib, tesla. And guess what it means? A body part. Yeah, but it goes deeper than that. Architectural element of God, the rib. The architectural element of God, the Tesla. He, he's getting down here with glasses, with pen. He's right down here like an architect working on the Tesla, on the rib. Not that it wasn't important when he made man, but when God is fashioning the woman... There's a Tesla architectural nature about God. Tesla. He'd taken from the man into the a woman, brought her to the man. Notice the first time Adam speaks in verse 23 is in response of the architectural element of God. What do we learn? The architectural element of God, church, demands that we speak up for God. In the context of Zechariah in Luke 1, which is a song, in Adam's song in Genesis 2, 23, 24, and 25, is actually the first song in the Bible. And he sings in light of the architectural Tesla element of God. God like a fine-tuned architect, like Danny building with a ruler, and, and down in there working hard. And God was the architectural element building the woman, and the only response from Adam 
is to break out in praise the defense of Tesla. And you look at our culture with the LGBTQ revolution. The way that we attack revolution is with God's revelation. And the way that we do that is we claim to be the church with the Holy Spirit. We, with love, have to be clearing up the confusion. Adam did. He's defending woman, man, man, woman, man, wife, man, wife. Oh, hearts pumping Kool-Aid. In the response of Tesla, in verse 23. And then the promise of Tesla, because Tesla has been tainted because of sin. The promise of Tesla is Genesis 3.15. Yeshua, Christ, Jesus, mercy that's tender. It's an inward body part whose rib in John 19 would not be broken, but whose rib and whose tessela would be pierced, providing mercy. Wow, yeah, wow. And the old Puritan Thomas Hooker was dying and a visitor was seeking to console the Thomas Hooker. He said, sir, you're going to receive a reward for your labor. The old Puritan on his deathbed said, quote, brother, I'm only going to receive mercy. Tesla, the architectural element of God's mercy, really reminds me of Paul in 1 Timothy 1.13, a great sinner. He said, though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insult opponent, but I received what? Mercy. And that's just the point. God has chosen to have mercy on hopeless sinners. That's it. That's it. Misery in their fallen state. Institute the new covenant and promise of forgiveness and righteousness and all that. Eternal acceptance with God. But once again, though, the, the progressive and the secular liberal culture that we live in, right? We love them. Yeah, we got to love them. But we cannot lock arms with that. We, they're going to mock us. And the thought of anyone begging for mercy is totally absurd. Really goes against their postmodern sense of self-determination and their own personal liberty that the lowest step of the ladder would be for absolutely anyone to beg for mercy. Any nation, though, that doesn't want to receive Yah's mercy, Y-A-H, the Jews wouldn't even sometimes say Yahweh is so sacred, they just say Yah, Yah. Anybody that doesn't want to receive God's mercy, some people aren't going to like this. Ezekiel 23 says that anybody that doesn't want to receive mercy 35, 23, 35, Ezekiel. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, because you have forgotten me and cast me behind your back. About a lot of body part talk today. Bear now the punishment of your lewdness and your harlotries. They've committed adultery and blood is on their hands. Do you think blood's on our nation's hands? you know Putin's pro-life? Not saying he's a good guy. Look how far we've fallen. They've committed adultery with their idols, even caused their sons, whom they bore, to pass through the fire. Moloch, Sacrificing children. You say this ain't a good message. Those that despise God's tender 
mercy. Wrath, Ezekiel 23, 25. Wrath, sword, and fire. But then also the tender body parts are going to be destroyed by God. Ezekiel 23, 25. God's going to remove noses and ears. Ezekiel 23, 26. He's going to strip off their clothes. Ezekiel 23, 29. They're going to leave you naked and bare. And Ezekiel 23, 34, and for the sake of children, you can read that one on your own. You say, this judgment of God is very dark. I said, I know. No one talks about it. But if we understand it, it makes the beauty, Phil, and as you said yesterday, Phil, the favor of God, that much more beautiful, would you say? Understanding bad news before good news, right? Which brings us to our third and final point. The blessing, the favor of the new covenant. He, Zechariah, the old priest, the old Jew, anticipated light. Light. He identified Christ in a very rich Old Testament metaphor, antitol. Look at what he says. Sunrise. You say, oh, I don't like all that dark stuff, but I bet you'll like this. That's the blessing of the new covenant. The sunrise. Literally means the rising here, the, the first light of dawn or on high represents uh, out of, exit, out of, literally, or from the height, refers to heaven. See it? He depicts Christ as this uh, radiant light from heaven who's going to shine. Light of salvation upon who? Those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. These are some of the most beautiful words I've ever read in my entire existence. Yeah. Not to mention, they're even more beautiful when we experience God in that relationship. And then, yeah, that's the message, isn't it? So, it's not really about what America has made the gospel into as what Mickey and I were discussing. Yeah, just come to church. Just come to church. No. Come to Christ. Because without Christ, you're in the dark. Come to the light is the message, not come to church. What about come to Christ? What about come and get healed? What about come and be delivered? We don't talk like that. What about come and be reconciled to God? What about come and receive light and a fire for God? Most importantly, how about life? Somebody said, oh, Josh, your life before Christ, addiction was a gift from God. I said, no, it wasn't. It was a gift from Satan. It wasn't a gift from God. It was death. And what we have now is life. We're living. For the very first time in our lives, we're living. Rachel, we're living. We are living. And be blessed to be living with you, with him. Why come? Because the old priest said in verse 79, I'm trying to hurry, I'm almost done. The old priest said, apart from the sunrise, you're sitting in the dark, you're in the shadow of death, like a jail cell. And it's comfortable for some people eating Bob Barker state food, just doing time. The moral darkness symbolizes sin. It's the realm of Satan, but God is light. It's Jesus Christ. It's incarnate. He came into the world as the light of the world. He's the light of the nations. To open up the eyes of the blind to bring prisoners out of the dungeon and those who dwell in the darkness from the prison. You can stock up on emergency food, which I have, and I hope that you will too. We can do all that. 
MyPatriotSupply.com. Everybody, lock and load. Okay, great, get her done. But understand, friend, there's no human solution to sin's dilemma. God sent a redeemer. That's the solution. And the evidence that one has received this redeemer, Zechariah says in verse 79 of your text, not the screen yet, the text, verse 79, the evidence that one has received this redeemer will be the fact that he will guide their feet into the way of peace. Peace. Lost sinners stumbling around in the darkness know nothing of peace. Peace at baptism when we're justified. Peace after baptism. Why? Because the kingdom of God is characterized by righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If we're a buzzkill to those around us, it's no wonder they don't want what we have. And then verse 18, the curtain is going to close on John the Baptist and it'll reopen again in chapter 3. He continued to grow, become strong in spirit, lived in the deserts until the public appearance of Israel. That's the price of being a prophet is being alone with God. Lonely man he was. Very strange and weird man. You say, well, what was he doing in the, de in the desert? Playing sports? And I have, no. No. I think in the desert what he was doing was he was dedicating his head to God because the message that he preached was repentance and he only lasted six months and he died. What about us? Plan of salvation. Please, please consider it. If you have questions, talk to us. Let's pray. Much more could be said, Father. I have not even scratched the surface of this most eccentric covenant. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you've dealt with sin. Thank you, Father, for forgiveness. In Christ's name we pray. Father, if there's anyone here, please, please change their heart. In Jesus' name, amen.